This is Zach Allen. Like many we have had on our channel in the past, Zach is what you might call a career criminal. Zach had a normal life up until the tragic loss of his wife and his son in a car accident in his early 20s. Not too long after that happened, Zach dove into the world of crime head first, starting with credit card fraud and moving all the way up to identity theft. He reportedly scanned the banks out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. From credit card theft to identity theft, get ready to hear about how he went about executing these plans in this week's episode of No Offense. Ready. Three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to No Offense. Thank you for tuning in today. We really appreciate it. Please uh, like, comment, and subscribe. It helps us out a lot. Our guest today was introduced to us by Matt Cox. Uh, we got thank Zach you, Allen Matt. on the show. <laughs> yes, thank you to Matt. You guys have an awesome friendship. Zach's got an incredible story. He's got a wild history with a lot of different scams, being in and out of the system, and we're going to talk all about it today. So we're super excited. Let's go. Let's go. Thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Nice to meet you. <laughs> in and out. I love it. <laughs> so, uh, so Zach, just starting off, I'm, I'm familiar a little bit with your story. I just, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happened, but I think a big proponent is um, a big incident that occurred to you just before a big incident that happened to you that was a pretty big change in your life. Um, if you could shed some light on that to the to the audience and just kind of start well, it, there. It, 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 it comes in my um like my college years because you know when I went off to college because I'm from Florida and then I ended up going to Texas for college and right right when I got there I met like my my sweetheart you know we started dating we were kind of working together and we just started dating. And it, it turned out like she became pregnant immediately. So <laughs> the dating got serious quick. So um, once she had our, our child, you know, um, we, we were we were making it like just barely, barely getting by. But it took both of our incomes. And of course, one day when I was at my job during the summer, um, I found out that her and my son died in a car wreck. Um, it's one of her classic moves, which was always like on a two lane road, if any slow car, she couldn't deal with it. If you weren't going the speed she wanted you to go, she had to pass. And so she tried to pass a vehicle. And sometimes when you try to pass a car, was I had no, I didn't notice it until it all happened. Sometimes when you try to pass someone, they'll just automatically speed up. I don't know what the hell that's about. And I guess that person sped up and then she couldn't, there was a truck coming the other way and she couldn't quite make the, the turn because the truck clipped the front part of the car and just like sit my, my son through the windshield, through the windshield and, and it caused her to go against the windshield and they both died immediately. And they were pronounced dead at the scene. So yeah, it was um, from being mostly single to like my entire world going from a, a group to just me. It was a, a horrible transition. It was one of those things like that type of grief. Like I remember recovering from it in different stages because like the, the shock of it, you know, and then the, the, the acceptance, like this is what it, what it is. I just remember going through different periods, like the beginning period, I couldn't even communicate with people. I, I wasn't able to hold thoughts or anything. And then there just came a time where I was in grief and despair and then it was kind of the morning where, um, like, I, I was just trying to process it. Like, I'm not going to move forward. Like, that the morning stage is where I felt like I was never going to find anybody else or I, I swore I would never have kids. As a matter of fact, my single daughter that I have now, I didn't have till I was 40 because I said there's no way I'm going through that, that, that again. So, yeah, it was, it was a huge issue for me. You know, um, Matt always, when, when he's counseling me, he tells me it was life-changing because it, it kind of took someone who worked, because I worked multiple jobs yeah. to make ends meet, to seeing work as the way to get ahead, to like, I don't care, I just want to get ahead. I don't I don't want to be broke anymore. So he thinks that was changed my character. So, but yeah, that's what happened. I lost my wife and son in a car wreck. How did you first, um, who told you about it? Did you, did you get a phone call or how did that happen? <laughs> no, it was, it's weird because it was at, she, we, we used to, we had a, a Isuzu, a Isuzu, I'm probably saying that wrong, Isuzu mm-hmm. Impulse, you know, one of those like clam looking cars. And I'm a big old black dude getting in and out of that little car. 
So we had a, a an impulse and we used to flip a coin because both of us wanted to drive it because our other car was a piece of crap. <laughs> you know, it had no AC. This was Texas hot, San Antonio, Texas hot sun. So we flipped on who would drive it. So a couple of times we just, she would drop me off or I would drop her off at work. And then we, whoever dropped whoever off, they drop our son off at daycare. So it just so happened that I lost that morning and she drove and she drove me to work. And when she left, it was probably about, well, I guess it happened when she was taking my son to drop him off because of the route of where she was. And so they called my boss. This is pre-cell phone. This is like the early 90s. <laughs> so they called my boss and my boss is the one who called me in. As a matter of fact, I thought I thought I was getting fired the way he was talked because, you know, I'm, I'm a laxer. You know, I'm one of those people that I work half of the time. As Prince said, <laughs> Raspberry Beret. In Raspberry Beret, I, I was very leisurely. You know, I, I'd fall asleep at my desk, all kind of crap, man. But anyway, so when he called me in, I thought he, he, he was going to fire me because the first thing he asked me is, how did I get to work? Like, how did you get here? You know, I told him, I said, my wife dropped me off. I Like, do I need to call her? And he's the one that kind of broke the news to me. Oh, my God. You know, and like the, the, I remember him, him telling me and then emotions are weird because when something that devastating happens, like, like the world vanishes, you know, our brain works where we process all the data in, we hear things in the background, but then when we get some news that sends our head twirling, it's like all the sounds get blocked out. Like your brain blocks out all the sound first and then he's talking and he's not even making sense. Cause I'm trying to process cause it, it became hard to process. But um, yeah, he told me that there had been an accident. So I'm like, okay, um, I need to get down there. You know, what hospital is my wife in? And he's kind of like, okay, I'm going to take you to the police, you know? And I'm like, okay, you know, you're going to ride me up to the place or you can, cause I'm thinking to myself, why don't you just take me to the house and I'll get my other car. Yeah. And he's telling me, no, I don't think you should be driving. You know, it, it's like he didn't break it to me that they were dead until we were in his car leaving. Like he didn't tell me that on the property. And later on, when I spoke to him, he told me he didn't want to tell me that because he wanted to be a, he wanted me to be able to get to the car so that he could take me where he wanted to take me. He didn't want me to, like, pass out or, you know, he said he's seen all types of incidents when that kind of thing happens. Like he said, that was like his third time telling somebody news like that. So, wow. Yeah. It was devastating. It was devastating. How long? How long did that take for you emotionally? I imagine it took it forever, but like to be like, I guess one's never recovered from it. But to be, I wouldn't say content, but at peace. So as I as I mentioned, it it was it was stages. So at the disbelief, I went on as usual, like in in my mind, thinking they're coming back. I'm like. They'll be home shortly. It's like oh. my mind told me they're not here now, but they're coming. And then during the and like I remember certain moments in each stage. So the disbelief is me like sitting and waiting for them to show up. Like when I went to bed, like I didn't lay down to go to sleep. I actually sat up in the bed like I'm sitting there waiting for them, and I would just fall asleep thinking that they're coming. I didn't fall asleep saying they're gone. So once the funeral happened, which is where I probably lost it because um, I had to be driven home and people were making arrangements to get me in my car, that's when the grief came. And in the grief phase of it, I remember sitting in my living room facing a window and like I did that for almost 48 hours. I, I got up to go to the bathroom only. I didn't eat anything. I just got up to go to the bathroom and I'd come back and sit. But I remember seeing the sun set, come back up and set again and come back up before I said, how long have I been sitting here? Like I, I haven't even eaten anything. I just processing thoughts. So it, it that's what I remember from that phase. From the acceptance phase is I remember um, going out with a couple of friends, like them having to beg me to go. And I'm out with them and like they're all partying, having a good time. And I'm just like, OK, I can't be here. Like I, I, I miss my wife. I can't be here. You know, I, I can't enjoy myself 
and hang out with these people. And I, I told myself, if I'm going to hang meet, uh, meet up with my friends, it's going to have to be at my house. I don't want to be out in public because I didn't know, like in my mind, I'm going, I'm not sure how I'm taking this. And I felt like that was accepting because I started being aware of what other people were thinking. The, the first two stages, I don't have any perception of what anybody's thinking about me. I'm just, you know, thinking myself. So the acceptance was I started worrying about what other people were thinking. The, the content phase is actually starting to do things like, you know, I played keyboards. So I joined up with a couple of friends that were in a band. I helped them out when their um, keyboardist wasn't there. So I kind of hung out, hanging out with them. That's what actually kind of brought me out of my shell because that's when I actually started having a good time without my wife being there. You know, my, my friend, her name was Jacqueline. She was like almost my best friend. Ever since the day we met, we spent 24 hours together constantly. If we weren't at work, we were calling each other at work or we'd get home and because we were broke. So we we play cards or we play um, crossword. We had a whole bunch of different games and competitions. So she was like my everything and my every day. And my son was the same thing. He kind of blended into all that. So, yeah, it was... Yeah, it's it's a devastating. It was a devastating time. It's a devastating time. I can imagine that's absolutely yeah, that's, horrible. That's insane. That's horrible. Thank you, thank you. Wow. My Lord. Moving on from there, after that happened, what was going on post? You know, you said you were obviously. I imagine because you, you know, now that this your significant other was, had passed away, money got a lot more tight. I'm sure. I imagine. Yeah, I. I so, um, two income household and school became a one income household. So like needless to say, my car, the Isuzu, um, it was, was absolutely totaled and we owed money on it still because at, you know, <laughs> this was before the days of um, full coverage insurance. Yeah, mandatory so insurance. <laughs> I had to make payments on it. So I was paying on two cars, only one of which I was driving. Oh, wow. Um, Electric bill and rent was way beyond what I could make. I stopped going to school. I took a hiatus and time off. And I even played, I played ball, but I had to take time off just to work because it, it was my perception. I had this thought that I could actually work two or three jobs and somehow catch up. So I'm paying bills in an apartment that I really can't afford. And I'm paying for cars that I don't have. It's just, it was, it, I was chasing um, a dream of, of going nowhere. So I ended up working very, very hard to, to make money. So it was, it was, it was hard to maintain. Lights got turned off every month. Like my electric bill got paid as a result of it being turned off. Oh, wow. <laughs> so my car was told, you know, I'd make payments because I had to, not because I had the money. It's because like, Hey, um, you, you're about to go without this and so you need to pay us. So that's how I ended up making payments. How long were you uh, struggling like that financially? About eight months, about seven, eight months before I, I pulled my, my, so I struggled most of my life until I started hustling. In fact, I'm not doing any scamming now and I'm struggling. So the part of my life that I'm not stealing, I'm struggling. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's funny, but um, yeah, I struggled up until I started stealing. The, the, the day I started reaping the rewards of the theft is the day that the struggle like left. Like it's as soon as because what happened was I, I got a hold of someone's credit card that had forty thousand dollars worth of credit, and I was working for this company called West Telemarketing, and West Telemarketing was a telemarketing company where we were calling about Sears sighting. I, I love that job, by the way. It was it was it was awesome. And because it's the camaraderie when you're on the phone calling people and, you know, we used to tape record. If a customer cursed you out, you tape record it. You know, we'd all sit around and listen to the insults because we thought it was hilarious. You know? <laughs> so because <laughs> I, I, I was telling on one of my podcasts is we had one customer tell us to take that siding and shove it up our ass. And we go, but Mr. Jones, it, it, it won't fit. You know? <laughs> Just fucking with him back. That's awesome. <laughs> That's right. But so, yeah, so um, we had different projects. We were calling on um, um, Sear Siding, Finger Hut. They had AT&T Long Distance. This is back when you paid for long distance calls. 
And then all of a sudden, AT&T comes out with this universal card where it's a credit card and a calling card at once. Isn't that amazing? Like, I don't know. You guys are way too young to remember the day, to remember what a calling card was. <laughs> we used to buy that. calling cards at Walgreens to make long distance calls. That's wild. Yeah, I do not know what that is. <laughs> yeah. You do not know what a <laughs> I've never heard of that. <laughs> I want you to. I want you to imagine. So I had home phone service, and I could not make a long distance call. So if I wanted to call my mom back in, I was in Texas, back in Florida. I'd have to go to the store and buy a five dollar long distance call, and I'd punch in about forty numbers. You know, you you dial you dial an eight hundred number, then you would dial your mom's number, then you punch in about twenty numbers on this calling card, yeah. then a pin number. <laughs> That's wild. Okay, you can make yeah. a call. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to make a long distance phone call. So, but we, we used to sell long distance service. So AT&T had a card that was a calling card and a credit card. And that was one of the top, I was a, one of the best salesmen on that project because um, West Telemarket would pay us $10 an hour and $2 for every card we could give away. And in an hour, I could give away four cards. Oh, so I was making like 18 bucks, 19 bucks an hour in, in the early 90s. So I was like, yes, big <laughs> money. And so one gentleman wanted a, um, he had been pre-approved. Because first when the AT&T card came out, it was normally about $10,000 limit. Then all of a sudden they got buck wild and started offering people forty and $50,000. So this one guy got pre-approved for $45,000 credit card. And as I'm making, when you make the sale, you have to record it. So I record him and I go through the process of the application, get all of his information. And at the end of the call, he said, you know what? I don't want it. And he hung up on me. And I said, I can't believe this. This was going to be my fourth sale. I was going to make 18 bucks this hour. I go, who would not want a free card worth $40,000? So I, then something in my head said, what would happen if you changed his address in this application to my address? Mm. Right. So I did it. I changed the information in the computer, wrote down all of his pertinent information on a piece of paper and, and, and um, wrapped it up, folded it up and put the sale through. Of course, I deleted all the stuff that was on tape yeah. and about three weeks, three or four weeks, I had completely forgot. Matter of fact, the paper I had when I went to my car, I was thinking about it when I went to my car and I think I put it on the seat. I put it somewhere and I'm telling you this because... When I forgot, and because I was broke, I only checked my mailbox maybe once a month, you know, because it was full of bills. All I ever got in the mail was bills. I never got good news. So I would go to my mailbox. One People time just harassing you. <laughs> I'm like, what do they want? So I'd go to my mailbox once a month and I'm pulling all this mail out, right? And I see this letter from this guy, right? Because, you know, I take the mail, it's a big bundle. So I'm walking it back to the house. And then I see this letter from the guy and I feel it and there's a card in there. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. So I'm like, what do I do with that information? I spent about an hour going through all, cause I was a slob, going through all the little balled up pieces of paper that was in my car before I actually found it. So then when I found all this information, I activated the card. And it was from that moment that I wasn't, like I, up until I went to federal prison, I had not been broke again. Like that was like the moment that I went from struggling and worrying about my bills to never struggling and worrying about my bills. So when I took that money, so. Damn. <laughs> so did you pay off everything right away? And then you're like, let's go get what? some shit. <laughs> what? Listen, they came with, with what they call convenience checks where you could transfer balances. I just wrote myself a, a and I only wrote myself like a $9,000 check. I paid everybody. I paid off my cars. I, I went back to school. I actually paid off my school, part of my loans, started going back to class, quit one of my jobs. It's a, re re a relieving <laughs> day. Yeah, that's <laughs> I'm living it up. Listen, I had been in Texas. I left for Texas in like 88, once I graduated high school. And I was there and I didn't come back home to 94 when I first wow. took that card. Oh, wow. When I took that card, that's the first time. In fact, I remember everybody going, he's coming back. Yes, I have the money to come home. <laughs> <laughs> I can do this now. <laughs> so did you, okay. So before that, going back was not even a, like, that wasn't even a thought. Like, you, hey, Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. You know, like, how much was the uh, calling card that you had? It was five bucks. 
So speak quick. Speak fast. <laughs> I got 30 minutes. Damn, that's rough. Yeah. So then, Yeah, it was, it was our life. Did you instantly from here be like, all right, this how do is, I get another one? Or like, yeah. what was your thought process after this? Uh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. It, 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 it became a, a, a racket where... So what was funny is what I told Matt is the $40,000 took me about six months to spend. Okay. So I spent the 40000 because it like I had never had that much money. And and really, once I took like I wrote a check for like 8000 and that check lasted almost three months. And that's me going home and coming back because I I'd never had money like that. So I didn't spend it. And paying my bills only ended up being almost wasn't even a thousand. It was like. But, you know, when you're behind and you're making one or two hundred dollars a week, this is back in the 90s now, yeah. where you're making one or two hundred dollars a week, you know, it doesn't add up to anything. So somebody gives you eight bands. I spent like eight, six, seven hundred dollars and caught up all my bills. So, of course, I'm broke. So I never spend money. So I might go out to McDonald's, but I just realized I had money. And as I started spending it, of course, it started going faster. So the forty thousand lasted six months. Then I had stole another thirty or forty thousand, and that only lasted like four months. Oh, wow. Then the next time I stole forty, like it got to the point where I was stealing forty thousand, and it wasn't even lasting a month. Oh, I'm like, there's God. no way this forty's gonna last. Where were you <laughs> finding these next cards from, or these next amounts? Um, from 18. from West Telemark. From that same thing. From West, like I I I worked. I had so much money that I. It's it's weird when I was scared of losing my job, right? Then. Like I stayed where I was and I did what they told me when I started stealing money and didn't care if I lost my job, they actually promoted me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at first, you know, I'm like, Oh my God, I need this job. I'm sorry. Please God. You know, then after like, what? So you're late. And <laughs> like, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. They're like, I like this guy. This guy's got balls. Let's keep him around. <laughs> He's got balls. You're right. I just wanted to let you know. Yeah. Well, don't do it next time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, did anyone know about this shit? Like, did anyone know that you were doing this or was it super? No, all or? of a sudden I'm rich. Damn. That's all it was. It's just like all of a sudden I'm rich and, and no one asked me where are you getting the money? No you know, is. where's it all coming from? Hey, that's a nice car. Is that a Ferrari you're driving? Yeah, it's a Ferrari. What about Did you actually have a Ferrari at this point? Like at the. <laughs> of course. Oh, <laughs> you fucking of course. Out. Listen, I, I had because you had to record whenever you got their application. And so I got a job where I was actually training people, right? And so I would go in and I'd say, hey, let me get a tape full of recordings. So a guy goes, oh, here's the tape. It's got 40 applications. So I'd listen to the tape and, and only if they got approved for 30 or 40,000 did I ever write the information now. I had like 80 tapes. Holy shit. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I was $40,000 cards. I was getting them like all the time, just consistently back to back. Cashing them out, ace the bump, bump, bump. Just living it up. How long? <laughs> Started with six months and went down to, to two two forty thousand dollar cards a month. Oh my, oh my god. god! So you were raking it in. <laughs> so you were loving was, your job at this point. It was crazy. <laughs> strip strip joints. I mean, I had women galore. Yeah, I was definitely over my uh, first wife then. <laughs> oh my god! That's crazy. <laughs> So yeah, living it up, man. So did you living did, it up? Did you get uh did you get caught this time around with uh with the cards in the telemarketing company? No. You never got caught? No. No, not with no. Damn. Not not at not at all. Not with that. Damn. Not not with that at all. Matter matter of fact, um what got me arrested was um I was uh attracted to land because when I was with West, I became a trainer, I had to wear a tie. And so I would order these 100% silk um, woven cottons from a company called Land's Inn. That's what got me arrested. Well, you know, that was my, my first arrest was, uh, of course, when I was a teenager, uh, a manager at McDonald's fired me and I got pissed off and I came in and ordered a large orange drink and I threw it on him, you know, and so he gave me a trespassing. <laughs> he gave you a trespassing? <laughs> yeah, no trespassing. That, that one doesn't count, though. Yeah, that doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, you know, that's, that's an everyday one. That, that one's justified. That guy sounds like a dick. Yeah, that's, oh, fire, man. <laughs> Where this orange drink, you bastard? But, anyway. <laughs> but, 
which is bad. You know, that was a bad thing to do. I apologize to him if he's listening to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Throw an orange drink on me now. All right? like, so, so how but, how long did you were you pulling these cards for for this thing? Like before, like like before how, your next one. Well, yeah, before, before your next, next one, like, and then like, not, not just the next uh, one. But how long two, was this spree of just pulling cards from this? Because obviously you moved on to different things. I know. Like how almost two years, two years, two years. and you never get caught. <laughs> No. And what would that happen? What would happen when these? Listen, I had the cards coming to my house. Oh my! Then I had them coming to because then the company started saying, "Well, you know, we we can't send another card. We had eight cards coming to this house." So then I just have it come to a buddy of mine's house. Like I like hey, and I give people a weird story. Like I just say, "Hey, my such and such, my brother is is ordering a couple of things, and he can't have it sent to my house. He doesn't want his wife to know about it." He's paying a hundred bucks. Can he have it sent to your house? Yeah. Then they give me like I, I send it to their house, and they give me the card, and I'd be off and going. You know. So what would happen when these? Because obviously, eventually, they're going to be looking for this money back. If it's a credit card, right? So what would happen when these banks start looking for this money? You, you know what's so you know what's so funny is um, I remember the evolution of identity theft yeah. because for a while it was not a crime. Doing that was literally. There was no crime for it. Taking using somebody's information and getting a loan, they actually didn't have a charge for it. Really? So I remember yeah. watching the evolution. I remember the people who testified in front of Congress about people living in their identity, using their names, pulling their credit cards, becoming them, and there was no law. Is so I've hold seen on one second. evolution. Hold on, hold on. calling cards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ask your parents about long distance. Like, I'm going to call them after this. I'm going to tell was, them. But that was an issue. <laughs> that was an issue. Listen, five and six hundred dollar phone bills. My God. Like the call family. If you didn't live close to your family, you're paying a there fortune to talk there to them. Oh, oh my God. Okay. All right. So Go ahead. evolution now we're back. people yeah. testifying in front of Congress. Yeah. Yes. To make identity theft a crime. I was. I watched the evolution of that. I did that. Forever, I was doing that forever. I was buying cars in other people's names, but mostly I was doing the one from the telemarketing place, just getting their identity and the universal card, and then this MBNA card, and and just taking, getting two cards in their name and just cashing it out. That's that's all I would do. I would just get it and cash it out. I'd get these little convenience balance transfer checks and write them to myself, my name and everything, and just cash them out, and then never pay it, throw it in the garbage. And, and, and crazy. De la v is so, what it was. So when these people were like, when the the persons whose whose card it was supposed to be, were they would they like report them, and the bank would give them the money back, or kind of forgive it, or do you know what would happen on that end? What if I told you I had no idea? You, yeah, wow. it makes sense. I had no idea. I would imagine. Well, back then, I have no idea. I don't. I don't know if it became a black mark on them. If the bank gave the money back, I have no clue of what was going on or how, how it affected them. So um, I never got used when I got busted for something, then I understood the consequences or what my actions meant on another person. Right. And doing that, I never knew what my actions meant uh, to, uh, to, to those poor victims that uh, whose information I was using to get credit cards. Yeah, Cause you didn't in, see in my mind, I was stealing from the banks, but I know that I was actually hurting people by doing that do you think that you, you were know? like a little jaded too like just after what happened to you you were kind of just in your own world and yes yeah that makes a lot of sense yes. i think the the original me would have never done that mm -hmm. like before my wife died i would have never because i wouldn't have i i would have had too much at stake to lose right and like i, I never felt like i had any it was just me and i i didn't get attached to anybody so I never felt like I had anything to lose. It's like, who are you? I don't care who you are. I'll take whatever risk. So I felt like I had nothing to lose. So that, that became me. But doing that helped me meet Anthony Robbins because like, I was living in um, San Antonio, uh, in uh, San Antonio, Austin. And then I moved to Atlanta and I was living in Atlanta, but I was going back and forth because I was still kind of in the band. So on the weekends, I'd fly into Austin and, and help them with a gig and fly. I was flying back You're and flying forth. Back so and I had forth. done that so many times, right, that Delta actually made me a gold member and they upgrade me and put me in first class. So one day when I'm in which like this was all mind blowing in my 20s, mm -hmm. you know, like so many chicks, so <laughs> many chicks. But but what 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 blew my what blew my mind is 
Okay. So what, what had happened to me is I'm, I'm living in Atlanta and I'm flying back and forth to Austin. And, and you know, naturally, I used to f- fly friends to and from <laughs> to and from at, at Atlanta where I was. So I'd meet a girl somewhere and I'd be like, how about I fly you in Atlanta? But anyway, and I could put him in first class with my ticket. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, it, it was, you're, I'm the shit at times. <laughs> so um, I get on an airplane and I meet a guy that is. All right. So let me let me tell it in, in sequence. So Anthony Robbins is giving a seminar in Atlanta and I'm like, oh, I'd love because I took one of his personal power courses you know, um, for motivational, just to, to be up on it. And I was, I'm kind of into that stuff. Yeah. So I bought one of his courses for like three or $400 and I took it and, and I enjoyed it. And then I find out he's coming to Atlanta. So I'm like, oh man, I'd love to go to that. So I call to get a rate on the tickets and they're like, okay, you come in Friday, e- it's a weekend. So you come in Friday evening for about three hours. And then on Saturday, you come in at eight in the morning and you're there until about 9 p.m. at night on on, on, for, on Saturday. And then on Sunday, you come in at about 11 or 12 and you're there to about 7 p.m. I said, OK, cool. I'll do that. How much is it? Uh, Fifty six hundred dollars. I'm like, well, me and how many I mean, how many people get to go for 56? Just you. I'm like, you can kiss my ass. <laughs> Love you, Tony, but I'm not paying that kind of yeah, money. Yeah, it's big. So, yeah. So, and, and I, I made that decision. So what had happened was I got on a flight and, and, you know, he fills that stuff up and he books it months in advance. So it's like like four months before he'll be there. So I'm on a flight from, I can't remember if I'm, if I'm heading to Atlanta or from Atlanta to Austin. And I get on there with a gentleman that works for um, the company Plus in the French Riviera, making like $120,000. Now, we're talking, we're drinking and talking. I'm buying him drinks and we're drinking and talking. And he's telling me, oh, yeah, you know, I got this job. I'm making $120,000 a year. I'm like, twenty grand. I go, that's about what, well, I was making way more than that. But I'm like, that's about what I claim I make. <laughs> so I'm like, that's, that's about, you know, that's awesome money. I said, how did you get that job? He said, uh, Anthony Robbins seminar. I said, an Anthony Robbins seminar? He goes, yeah. But I'm, thinking, I'm like, man, I go, bro, those things cost 5,600 bucks, man. There's no way I'm going to pay that kind of money to go see Anthony Robbins. And he goes, but it's worth it. I said, I don't see it as being worth it, man. And he made it worth it. But that minute he goes, ask yourself this one question. It's sold out. He goes, who do you think paid the $5,600? He goes, imagine in your mind the type of people that paid that kind of money to see Anthony Robbins. And I'm like, yeah, very rich people. He goes, so you would be hanging out with some extremely wealthy people who are trying to personally improve themselves. So he goes, you meet them in an opportunity where you get to work together with them like a human being. He goes, that's an opportunity for you to meet, to rub elbows with some of, some of the, um, the country's greatest sold me. I'm like, I got off the plane and said, let me give you whatever John Doe's credit card and pay for that (laughs) ticket. (laughs) I like how you're stingy with someone else's money. (laughs) That's too much money. I'm not letting John Doe pay that. Are you kidding me? I mean, that, that could get, that could get me laid four or five women. (laughs) But come on, man, that's a lot of sex. I'm giving up Anthony. (laughs) It's costing you. But but what that led to is when when I was there, when I was there, he, it was a great seminar. He had a couple of people coming up, but he was actually recruiting for this program that he had going on called Train the Trainer, where what he was doing was he was at, at that time there was a lot of phone rooms and customer service centers popping up all over the country. And he was training people on how to train people. Mm. And it was a program he had called Train the Trainer. So he picked an elite, like, I think it was 11 of us to sponsor that program with all the companies that he sent us around to, to train their people how to train people. So he picked me or I got picked as one of the personalities. I'm joking around when I'm there, having a great time, you know, slept with this this, uh, businesswoman from Seattle. I I loved it. I loved it. And, and and so and then I got picked for that job. I got offered the opportunity to work for Anthony Robbins, which I'm like, are you serious? He had a woman that approached me 
and gave me a card and said, Anthony Robbins would be interested in hiring you. Now, when he hired the 11 of us, it was nine white males, me, no, it was eight white males, me, an Asian guy, and a woman, a white woman. So we used to all joke, and us three hung together all the time, the Asian, the white woman, and me, because we said we're the tokens. <laughs> I'm not misogynist. I have a woman on my team. Yeah, literally. I'm not great. I have a black guy. <laughs> so, yeah, and I got that job. That job paid $115,000 a year, paid travel expenses and hotels everywhere. When I went to... China, I had, when I landed, I had an interpreter that was with me outside the hotel room. Like they asked, and and they would interpret, like whenever someone was talking to me, they would talk to them, ask to tell me what they said. I would respond and they'd tell them back. They interpreted all my classes and everything. I just walked around with his presentation and presented teaching people how to teach people. That's insane. And traveled the entire world. Went to to Austria, um, Australia. I mean, I visited probably about 35 countries. Damn. Do all this from starting off stealing money at a at a telemarketing company, which kind of led to that. It was it was um, unbelievable. It was amazing. Were you still uh, finding ways to steal money while you were working for Tony Robbins? Yes. <laughs> Did you ever you think mean, about stealing Tony Robbins money? <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like that guy's got a lot of money. <laughs> oh my goodness. He has a, we went to his, um, his castle. He has a castle in feet and on a, oh, he owns, Fiji. this is back in the nineties. He owned a Fiji, an island in Fiji. Damn, and he damn. took us there where it's a, it's a, it's a resort. His house is a castle and the rest of the island is a resort. So we're staying there on the island where we're going in the different training. We met, I worked for him for about almost two years and we went there about four times and, wow. and just like parties and groups. It, it was just the 11 of us. He wow. he had someone under him that taught us most of the time. He made, I met him in person about three times. Like he'd sit around and talk to us. And as I was telling Matt, he actually, because we were his elite group, he he's the one that called and fired me when, when I did get arrested. So I, I, gotta, I guess I got to tell that story. <laughs> yeah. You got a personal, a personal note from uh, Tony, Tony Robbins. Robbins. <laughs> a personal termination from Tony Robbins, which I tell Matt was the most motivating firing I ever had in my life. You know, was it wasn't it? like you're out of here. It was kind of like when it was done, I'm like, yes. Well, yes! I, okay, before you tell the story of being arrested and everything, I, w- I want to hear the story of how Tony Robbins fires someone <laughs> at that time. Because that's not All right. So, so what I, as I told you, I had this addiction to these lands in shirts that were monogrammed on the cuff and on the shirt pocket with my initials, you know? So I, I loved it. And, and, and every time like I walk up to someone and I'd see them looking at the initials on the shirt, it just kind of, kind of gave me, you know, it made me horny. You know what I'm saying? I loved it. It made me feel like I was uh, like, I was classic and stylish, yeah. you know? So now I'm wearing Marshall shirts, but it's okay. But <laughs> One of these shirts back in the 90s cost $70. Wow. That's how woven, mm-hmm. beautifully woven the cotton was. It was They were gorgeous. So um, I would, when I was working for Anthony Robbins, the way it worked was I would be gone for three weeks into different trainings and I'd be home for one week. So you'd be gone for three, you'd land and you'd be home for seven days, seven or eight days. On the, that day, you'd fly back out and you wouldn't come home for three weeks. So he kind of had you rotating in and out. I loved it. I'm bouncing, bouncing around the world traveling. And so what happened was I still had some old cards. And I forgot to tell you this. Whenever I would um, take someone's identity when I was working at West and order an ATT card in their name, I would also order their credit report. And back then the credit report came with the full card number. So I would actually use not only the card that I ordered, but I'd use cards in their wallet to order me shirts from Land's End. So I constantly ordered clothes from them. I had an, an, an addiction. And that actually what, what got me arrested. Because when I ordered the clothes, they'd come straight to my house. So one day when I'm home for my week, the police come, they, you know, they knock on the door and I open the door and they come barging in and they arrest me for... <laughs> ordering shirts. And they told me that like, you know, you've gotten like $4,000 worth of clothes sent here in the last three months. 
<laughs> you know, which didn't make sense because each month I was making about almost after tax about eight or nine thousand dollars. It, it yeah. never made sense. And like yeah. I had over two hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Holy shit. And I'm still using other people's credit card to order shirts. I like if, if I were to go back in time. <laughs> That that would be the one thing I would change about what I did. I have no explanation for why I was doing that. <laughs> you were like, I would sit down to order and not even use my own card. I'd use somebody else's. <laughs> so they came in and they arrested me. So when they took me to jail, this is Cobb County, um, Georgia, which was weird. So they came in, they took me to jail. Um, I had like seven counts of, of, of credit card fraud. Right. And I'm in jail. And I when I get there, I go to first appearance. Like When I go there, I have no bond. So then I go to the first appearance and I still have no bond. So I'm in jail. So I end up having to call my mom, who's in Florida, and give her access to my bank account. And they drove up here to hire a lawyer to get me a bond. So I was supposed to leave. I was supposed to leave and go back out to work. But I ended up like on a three way call from the jail calling in sick, telling them I can't make the flight, I can't make my class, and they had somebody cover for me. Which, I was I was a workaholic. Like, a lot of times, my week home would only be like three or four days because I wanted to be out on the road because that's where the women were and I could be out partying and enjoying myself. So I was kind of a workaholic. So I felt like me calling in wasn't anything suspicious. And, and you know, we had a person, her name was Rachel, we had a person we reported to. She goes, oh, no problem, we'll get that covered. And she covered my ship. But, when I got out of, I finally got bonded out of jail, right? And I went back to work. I went and worked. So when I got out of jail, I went and worked my three weeks. And when I came home from the three weeks, that's when I never went back to work. And what was weird is the 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 trip that I was on, like usually I'm going from training to training to training to training. I'd go to the training, then I'd have a lull, and then I'd go to another training. So it wasn't like, three full weeks of training. It was probably like a week of training that got spread out over three weeks. So I didn't make that many presentations. I thought that was very odd. I never thought I was going to be fired because I didn't think he knew I was in jail because I covered my tracks. But I thought it was odd that I wasn't back-to-back training because, I, like I said, I talked to, to two other people that worked with me and they were filling in on extra jobs. Jobs that, like, I'm like, I don't know why he won't send me to that. I'm like, I'm, I'm like a three hour flight away. Why would he send me to do that? I don't know. He's got me doing it. So, so when I came back, right, uh, the, my, for my week off, right, I stayed the week off and then um, I didn't get an itinerary. So normally about halfway through your week, you get an itinerary. The woman that normally gives it to me said, um, yours is being delayed. We're kind of processing it up. We're doing some rearranging is what she told me. She goes, you'll probably have it on the normal day that I leave, like on a Monday. She said, you probably have it by then. We'll let you know where to go. Well, it was a Tuesday because the Monday I didn't have it. And when I called her, she's like, you know what? I think Tony wanted to talk to you about like the the, the spots that he's going to have you go. So he's going to call you. And I'm like, wow, Tony's going to call me. Like, Very wow. Nice. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he called. He didn't mention the arrest. But he fired me. So basically what he was telling me, he was going, he goes, listen, opportunities come at the strangest thing. This is like, this is, this isn't word for word, but this is kind of how he, how he put it. He goes, opportunities come at the strangest time. He goes, you are one of the best trainers that I've had doing this. He goes, cause he, I think he had replaced like two or three people for various reasons. I don't remember what it was. But one thing he did tell me a lot was that I was very good. I'm very good at talking. And he goes, you have such skills, right? He goes that I don't think that the hundred thousand dollars I'm paying you is enough. Right. That, think about this is a roller coaster. I'm on the phone with this guy and now I'm, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm getting a race. So. <laughs> oh my God. so he's telling me, he goes, I don't think what I'm paying you is enough for what you're worth or the talents and, and the possibilities you bring to this job. He's saying, he goes, what, really what I think I'm doing, I think I'm holding you back. He goes, I think you've presented yourself to enough companies that there are offers out there waiting for you that you haven't you haven't taken the time to pursue. I want to put you in the position 
to pursue a future that's going to make you the most money you could ever make. I'm like, are you serious? He goes, yes. He goes, because I'm holding you back. Gaslighting Here's shit. That is the most like narcissistic but awesome way to fire someone. <laughs> yes. I'm going to set you free so, so you can make what you're like actually- Dom dumps girls. <laughs> <laughs> Which being considerably less for the rest of my life. <laughs> oh my god, that's so fucking funny. That is amazing. He's like, that he's like. Hilarious. Long story short, pack your shit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're out of there, buddy. But it's a chance. <laughs> what well, did you ever find out the real reason why? No. If somebody asked me in one of the comments in my podcast, if did I find out how he knew I got arrested? Because he he didn't come clean of of. Uh, that's the only reason I could think he fired yeah, me. Yeah, because he probably what I would imagine, up. Right. What I could imagine, because I wasn't guilty of anything yeah. at that point. What what I can imagine, I think it was, I think maybe one of those detectives, because, you know, the police and the, um, and the Secret Service came because of the mail. And I think somebody called him or called uh, his company. Yeah. yeah. You know, that and, and told him, like, hey, you got this dude and this guy's stealing, you know. So, we, you know, and he's like, really? Yeah, he's out of there. You know, yeah, just to so, you know a government. conversation, just to give you a motivational <laughs> speech. Gives you the best motivational like speech of your life. And I love you that. off. How do you like that? that? Damn. So, yeah, terminated with, with motivational term, termination. That, is awesome. that had to have bummed you out a little bit, right? Because you were probably having so or much fun doing so this. were you just so fired up? Or were you fucking <laughs> ready to go? Like, yeah. You know what, Tony, well, you fucker, you were holding me back. <laughs> I, when I hung up, right, I'm thinking... Because he's right. People offered me jobs, right? And I had discussed that with him before. And he's like, you know, he's like, whenever an opportunity comes that you think is worthwhile, you know, he goes, let's have a conversation. He's always say that. Let's have a conversation about when an opportunity comes. And people did offer me jobs. So I'm thinking that someone told him that I got offered a job. But then when I started pursuing you know, I, I'm like, wait a minute, this dude fired me. <laughs> that asshole! <laughs> That's you funny. know, so, yeah. I mean, to this day, he could claim that he really gave me an opportunity to make more money. But, I mean, it's it was a termination. It was a termination. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, and he, he said he was doing it on my behalf. I'm doing it for you. <laughs> like, thank you. Like, thank you so much. Dude, that's phenomenal. That is phenomenal. Everyone should take a note everyone on that. Should that's take how a everyone note should on fire that. people from now on. <laughs> I'm help you make I need money. you to come to my office. I want to do you a quick favor. You know? yeah. I want to talk to you and I want, to, gonna, do you, I want to do I'm, you a solid. I'm kicking you out of here so you can be somebody <laughs> new. You know As you're leading him out the office, you know, you have a lot of opportunities coming for you. you just, <laughs> make sure you box. Here. Bring yeah, the box. Go get him, Tiger. Yeah, that's right. What about my stuff? Screw that shit. Get out of here. You get nicer shit, man. That's All right. That stuff's holding you back. That's right. So what? After that, did you go? I'm assuming you went and made more money. I'm assuming, right? Some way. Well, I mean, so that was the most prestigious job. The answer yeah. is no. I started doing credit card fraud that's I mean. immensely. <laughs> and then I started going to jail. I mean, I started, you know, like the, the cycle began. I started doing all kinds of types of um, different frauds and end up getting caught for it. I mean, that, that's basically what happened to me. When he, when he did that, because as I mentioned, you know, the, the laws were changing and people were being aware of what was going on. So it wasn't some new fad, fad going on. So I, I started going to jail. You started using people's information. Um, the credit bureaus started reporting and calling them. Hey, did you apply for this? Wow. You know, it's just like everything changed and I ended up getting, I got, I got arrested like four times for that type of stuff. So it was, it was bad. Ended up going to jail in Cobb County <clears throat> twice. Then I moved to Florida, the Sarasota, where I live with my mom and started working for the cable company and stealing people's information, ended up going to jail. Then I moved to Tampa and started stealing people's information, ended up going, I just started, started going to jail. It, just yeah. was, it was a complete downward spiral. Um, he... That job probably, I was in so in, in, entrenched into that, which I, I can't figure out why I didn't get out because I had a ton of money. I owned a house. I ended up selling my house. I made it for a while without really having to steal. But when, you know, you get used to spending a lot of money, you realize, you know, it starts going fast and it's not being replenished fast. 
And so I had to make adjustments, you know, plus going to jail wasn't helping because that was lawyers. Everything was eating the money. So I ended up losing everything. So damn, came a bad way. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What were these, <clears throat> what were these new methods of fraud that you were doing? Um, different, different things. Like, um, I found, I started making fake, I, I, I hooked up with a guy that was a computer whiz that I met in jail and we started making fake IDs. And so we'd go around and get, um, credit immediately at like circuits. You remember circuit city, mm-hmm. yeah, like a yeah. best buy yeah. circuit mm-hmm. city, um, target. So we, all these places that would give people credit as they walked in. Um, I started doing that, getting credit. Or I would steal credit card numbers from this electric supply company that I work for. And I started renting cars, you know, using the, but, and, and that's something I got from Anthony Robbins, which was the uh, corporate rental for mm-hmm. rental cars. You know, whenever you bypass the counter for all the rental car companies, they keep a credit card on file. Well, I mm-hmm. exploited that system by using stolen credit card numbers and keeping it on file. And I was renting all kinds of cars. Like I was, living in in rental cars when i lost my cars i never had to have a car because i could take a credit card number just be in a rental car for 30 40 days so uh, and of course i ended up going to jail for that so i just started exploiting all types of different systems getting immediate credit where like i did that one time and got credit and then ended up calling the person he's like no that's not me standing there getting credit then i go to jail so it's all kind of bizarre bizarre things all that stuff kind of um, led me to meet my my second wife, um, who I ended up going to federal prison for, or pr- prison not for, but with, you know, for um for for stealing for stealing money. How that happened? How'd you guys meet? Um, I had I had just gotten out of jail, and I um on the, one of those um, live live chat lines. Mm-hmm. You know, um, what happened was I had gotten out and in, in Atlanta, when I was re recouping, I used that for all my hookups. That was where you find the cheap women. <laughs> the other women were pretty expensive, but you'd go through that to find the cheap women. Okay. So one time when I got out, I was in Tampa. So I went back on it thinking I could get me a cheap woman, you know, but she ended up not being cheap, you know. <laughs> so, she was one of the first um, chat people that I spoke to. So I got on the phone and chatted up with her and we decided to hook up. But we didn't, she wouldn't hook up on the first hookup. She made me wait like 40, 30, 45 days. I had to take her out a couple of times. She made me become a gentleman, but ended up, you know, I kind of caught feelings for her long before we ever had sex. But um, it's just just dating and, and hanging out with her. But that's how I ended up meeting her. But she became a like a Bonnie to my Clyde. She was the only woman I ever dated that was absolutely down with what I was doing. And in fact, um, wanted to help and coax and gave me ideas that I didn't even think of myself. So no it was, way. what kind of, what kind of scams did you guys run together? We, we ran one where, um, well, it initially started off when I had gotten out of jail and, um, cause it, it, it credit card numbers had become, um, and, and I, I, I long gave up credit card fraud cause that's what kept me going to jail. And, and But I ended up keeping a lot of credit card numbers. And I, I would keep it in a Gmail email account, which is weird. It's the one I have now. But I used to keep them in, in a Gmail like as a saved email. And so I would open those up and go in. So whenever I got out of jail, I would just rekindle my Gmail account, go in there and grab the, the file that was in there. And I might get a car or do whatever whatever I was using. But one of the things we were doing was when I had gotten out of jail, this was early 2000s, like 2002. That was the era of the prepaid phone. Because for a while, back in the days, the cell, only way you can get a cell phone if you had good enough credit to be approved for an account. Hmm. Well, in the early 2000s is when the prepaid card, prepaid cell phone came out and you would actually buy cell phone minutes. Well, drug dealers went bananas. <laughs> yeah. So what I would do is it would cost 15 cents per minute. And so what I would do is I would take somebody else's credit card, load a hundred dollars worth of minutes on your phone. Just give me 50 bucks, you know? So now you'd have like 800, 900 minutes on a phone for 50 bucks, you know? So you thought it was a good deal. And so when I started doing that, when I got with my second wife, 
you know, she knew a bunch of drug dealers. So she's like, hey, I can hook you up with my buddy and my cousin, blah, blah, blah. And so we started doing that, making the tune of like about eight, nine hundred dollars a week just selling minutes using credit cards. So that was one of the scams. And of course, that developed from just doing the minutes to, to paying people's electric and phone bills and cable bills and water bills and just maybe taking half of the money. So it, it evolved from j- just doing that to more to the point where we made over $250,000 in about a nine month period doing that Damn, on, a, on a list of about eight, 900 credit card numbers. Yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, so, yeah it, it, all, it all ended up being kind of lucrative you know, in that phase, you know, but an- another, another thing we do also is I told you, I met a friend that helped me make fake IDs. Another thing he did is he would put uh, an ID and a credit card on a piece of paper that I could fax to get you to stay in a hotel room. So like if, if you were staying in a hotel somewhere, I could call up and said, Hey, can I pay for that room? And then I would end up faxing the, a, a copy of, an ID and the front and back of a credit card. Well, a hotel would punch the number in and let you stay. Listen, I was doing that to the like in Vegas, and I could do that and say, "Hey, I want to cover two thousand dollars worth of chips for him." Also, so I could send you on a trip to Vegas, two thousand dollars worth of chips. Just give me a thousand bucks in cash, and you go and you check in. Yeah, we were we were going nuts. We were making money just taking credit card numbers and applying them in different places wherever we can making a fortune. And then unfortunately we did the hotel thing too many times and ended up going to jail <laughs> together. <laughs> how did they, how did they catch on to that one? So the, uh, the hotel one. Um, it, it's a matter of, you know, sometimes people are on top of their, their credit cards. And if I use it, you know, you might see the charge or get a, this is, of course, way before they give cell phone notices, you know, before that yeah. time. You might Statement notice, days, right? Yeah, or try to use the card and notice it that I, that somebody else has accessed it, and then you just call the police and tell the card that you didn't authorize that. And, of course, unfortunately, that happened while we were still in the hotel. <laughs> oh my God. Like, hey, 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 your payment just got canceled. You know? <laughs> Come on out. Come on what, out. What was that like? The police came to the, ho- the, police came to the hotel for you guys? Oh yes, yes. To like knocking, knocking very gently on the door, you know, and and then you know I open the door. It's one person, and then I open the door, and they they bum rush it. You know, you look out the peephole. It's one guy. You open the door, and they bum rush it. Or or um, another time in a hotel, um, they're they're coming. We got adjoining rooms, so they didn't know that we had gotten the, the adjoining, or they weren't aware. So when we went to the door, I could see that they were out there. And so we go into the adjoining room, right? And when they go, like we're timing it, we're standing at the door. And when they run into the adjoining room, we go out our other room and right down to the, into the stairwell. <laughs> Listen, they're looking for us in the hotel. We hear them make an announcement in the hotel. Oh, my God. <laughs> All guests, can you please stay in your room? We're looking for two. Yeah, few, they call them fugitives. They call us fugitives. Even though we had not been arrested at that time and we were on the run from the law, but they called us fugitives. Listen, we we got out of there. We went through the back and um, out the parking lot. I don't know how we got lucky to get out of there. We actually had to separate for a minute to get back together. But yeah, it at was it was. Huh? Go ahead. What were you saying? Oh, it was it was quite a life, man. Living like that is so. At the time, it's exhilarating. But, you know, thinking back, it's very stressful and, and kind of reckless, you know, but just putting putting your life and feud- freedom in danger over some thrill or over a hotel room that you really didn't even have to be in is what, what's so funny. It probably made Most for a really time. fun relationship. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's probably a really fun relationship. Yes. You know, you guys probably had a lot to bond over. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes that stuff is kind of exciting and exhilarating, and, and women love it. Women love it. That's that's the thrill, you know. It's, I guess it's kind of like surfing or whatever. It's the thrill of yeah, that. Yeah, right. they always say to do like a date night or switch it up or whatever. You know, you don't want to do like the same old, same old dinner every night. So you know, switch scams, <laughs> switch it up a little bit. Go go on the run for a couple of days. You know, oh, do something oh, fun man. with your girl. <laughs> oh, yes, we we had a blast. I mean, it was it was one of those things where going into into Circuit City and getting approved 
for loans, you know, being someone else, answering questions, all all the the hiding and ducking and beating the system, you know. Like, you officer, know. we were just doing role play. I don't understand why this has been your business. <laughs> 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 that's what it was, man. <laughs> when they would start, uh, cert- like for at that time, right? They're coming for you, right? Would you guys go? I mean, did you ever leave the state, or like, re- would you, you guys oh, just yes. kind of? We yeah. we moved from we were living in Florida, right? And and they came for us, and then we moved to Georgia, to Atlanta, Georgia, yeah, and they came for us, and then we moved to uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. <laughs> and they came for us. Then we moved to Salt Lake City, Utah, and they caught us. <laughs> Damn. Damn. Were you, I think Matt was telling your story. Were you the one you guys would do the drop phones on the people? Uh, with the, were you were you listening on court in court cases yes. and find people who needed? Oh, can you tell can, us about? Can you that. explain that? Because yeah. I really want to hear. So, that. so what what happened to us was we we as a couple got arrested. I think it was four times we had been arrested. As a couple, and about the the well, yeah, three times, and then the fourth was the feds, which when we got into the big money, and and that's what happened. I ended up getting into the to, to the big scam of things. But um, on the third time of our arrest, I, I kept saying, "Okay, this is this is ridiculous." I go like, "I have got to come up with something that that's not going to keep getting us arrested because we we get arrested." you know, spend like seven or eight months, get separated. And then I get out and then we, we get back together. I ended up doing always the most time. You know how they do that. It's like, so I'd get out and then we'd go and we get back together and then we get arrested. Then I'd get out and we go and we get back together to our parents dismay, by the way. So I would imagine <laughs> like, what is it you see in this guy? <laughs> he loves jail, but, um, so the last time we went to jail, I told myself, I go, we, we've got to do something different. I go, something has got to change because this pattern cannot continue on forever. So um, that's when I came up with the, the scam of being the victim and the perpetrator because I kept getting, getting tired of the, the victims coming to court. So what I would do is I started thinking of I will perpetrate a crime on myself. It's kind of like just stealing the insurance money. It, you know, it's kind of like I'll do the crime on myself because I'm not going to call the police and I'm not going to testify against me on the stand. And then I'll just take the the reward. I reap the rewards of it, like getting renter's insurance and then stealing my own stuff. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or like putting money in the bank and stealing my own money and just telling the bank somebody else did it. So, but in, we ended up in going to feds for that, you know, um, that, that type of fraud. But I guess it's kind of outsmarting myself. You know, in the feds, it was like a 17 year um, bid. I, I, I had 198 months, which is like 16 and a half years for trying to come up with el- when you elaborately scheme like that, because I had it set up to where we were doing that scam all over the country. And Damn. when, when yeah, they, they call that conspiracy. <laughs> they give a lot of time for conspiracies like that. Made a whole yeah. lot of money, but they gave me a lot of time <laughs> for that. So. How would that work exactly? Because I know Matt kind of told us a brief a little bit about it, but like what exactly would you do to commit that crime on yourself around the country? So, and, and that's where the meeting people in the court, because I didn't want to have to do it myself. I wanted to be able to send people to do it. So what I, what I would, and this is the day before the chip, this is the, the card. So I would clone a card. So what I would do is I would hire two people. I would fly you to another state where you would go and you would get an ID in someone else's name, or I would send you with a, a, like a fake Florida ID to Ohio and you'd go and you'd get a real Ohio ID. You would open up um, three bank accounts a piece. I would take $10,000 and I would put it in each account and I would pull that money out of that account. So you would go up there, You would chances are you would rent an apartment you would open up three accounts a piece. And when those debit cards, this is when the visa cards were given out to each account, when they come in the mail, you would actually swipe them and clone them. So you would swipe them and I'd get the information and I would create those cards in either Georgia. I think I was in Georgia at that time. I would recreate those cards in Georgia. And so then I would go out and I would buy money orders with those cards. So I would go to the post office or to the grocery store and purchase a money order with the card. Meanwhile, you're in Ohio. 
So what you would do is you would go in your bank and say, hey, somebody's stealing my money. <laughs> like I had $10,000 in your account this morning and now I have none. And what they would do is they would see that that was happening in Atlanta, Georgia, and you're standing there in Ohio. So then they would just give you the money back. So then what would happen is that one $10,000 I used would turn into $60,000. So then I would pay the two people like $5,000 a piece, and I just have them do that in different spots all over the country for me. And the way I would recruit people is we would go to first appearance. Like when you get arrested, you go to a first appearance where you see the judge and the judge would set your bond. So I would go to first appearance and sit there and kind of judge who would be a good candidate that I thought would go out. So I would just judge them by their appearance and look at them and they might bring you up. And and what happens is your record becomes your resume. You know, they, they'd come up and they'd go, Bob, he's here for petty theft, you know, drunkenness. I'm like, hmm. You know, and what I do is I'd write his name down and I might write him in the jail and, and tell him to call me. So what I would do is I would I would wait. I'd go to a first appearance. I'd get a my goal was to get about 25 names and then I'd wait about three weeks and see who was still in jail. If you were still in jail, I'd make you an op, uh, offer that I would bond you out. But I wanted you to do some work for me that would make you five thousand dollars. And that's how I kind of interviewed people to do the scam where we were going around, you know, stealing money from ourselves. <laughs> how many guys did you have working doing this? Um, point? Uh, unfortunately, um, at, at, OK, so I went through a lot of people. Right. But generally, I only had one team working. So what I learned is that a lot of people that go in and out of the jail has drug habit habits and um, druggies. If you give them a lot of money, can't maintain themselves too good. So so what will happen is when you're flying a druggie to another state, you know, and you're renting them a car like a like, let's say it's 2007. So in 2007, I would let them rent a 2007 Lexus and stay in a five-star hotel somewhere. And what will happen is they would drive the Lexus into a bad neighborhood because they're, they're, they're in Cincinnati, Ohio, or they're in yeah. Seattle, Washington, and they want to cop some dope. So let's just drive this you know, $30,000 car into a black neighborhood, and we might, we might be two white people. Well, you know, when the cops see that, you know what they do immediately, right? Yeah. So they ended up getting arrested for drug possession or I'd put them in a five star hotel. I had it set up under a business like I had started a business and I would get calls from the hotel. Like I had one time I had a call from a hotel saying um, you have two of your employees here. Well, I hate to tell you this, but I think your employees are on drugs because one hotel told me that the girl was walking around with no top on. She was walking around the hotel. Oh my God. You know? Shit. So, so it, yeah, it, it began. So I couldn't maintain the people. So I, I never had the, the the structure to put it together. It was just people here and there putting it together for us. But it, it just it never it never was a smooth transition. Just making the money as you go. And if like if it was a fuck up, like I'm sure people probably like I don't know. But would you you did you ever have money stolen like that? Or like or lose oh, money, yeah. you lose oh, out money because of that? Oh, heck yeah, heck yeah, yeah, plenty, right. Plenty of times. So yeah. So yeah, it was it, it was it, it was a rough it was a rough transition it was a rough transition. But like I like I said, I ended up being a huge conspiracy, which got me probably the most time in my life. I ended up doing like fifteen years for that. Spent so my whole forties in jail behind that. Um, I call myself coming up with a better system. So yeah, it wasn't that great. <laughs> so at that point, you had, at that point you had started when you were when like twenty. When did you 20, start? Did 20, you um like I started stealing. Like my wife died, my son, like I was 23. So probably about 24 is when I started. And How many previous stints did you have? Like, Would you just do a little eight, nine month sentence? Oh man, I probably did about seven of those. Wow. wow. I, I, I did about, well, about, yeah, about seven. And then I did the 15 years, you know, but no more. I can't do any more. I don't have enough time yeah. within me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait. So when you would go into these places, you were saying that you'd, you know, they'd, you'd have the clone card, right? Right. And they would take, you'd get the money back. Were you going in as a different identity every time? Because every, you can't be going in as, every okay, time. right. So you're a different identity because you can't be going in the same person. Hey. Right. Well, but $20,000 got stolen again. <laughs> right. Going from different state, from state to state, different states. Gotcha. And you had fake IDs and all this? Huh? Yeah, he had the guy printing them. 
Wow. So you, so, so you had all the fake IDs, everything? Yeah. I set, wow, I set okay. it all up. I'd send them to, to get it and they'd open up an account in a different state and I'm just bouncing around. And still, it was a, it, it was 10 and then sometimes it'd be $20,000 each. So it'd be 120,000 on one trip. You know, it was, it was a lot of money, but it was, it was a big headache. It didn't go as well as like when I thought of it, it didn't go as smooth, yeah. you know, cause it was dealing with a lot of different people. So it wasn't yeah. too bad. I, 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 how much money did oh, you make throughout that, that, that time doing that? All right. Yeah. The, what, I'm sorry. I didn't catch you. So how much money did you make throughout that time where you're doing the, uh, the crime on yourself one? Over a million. Really? Wow. Yeah. Shit. Because when my, when, when, when she got pregnant, cause I have a daughter now when, when she got pregnant, th- my goal was to, um, make about 3 million in stock. So I was, mm. I was trying to, I had a plan of putting a larger amount in, in place and that didn't go well. What I was saying is I'm, I'm going to have to go because <laughs> of the time. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. Okay. Was that okay. About yeah, five more minutes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, man. Totally. So, totally I'd totally, be totally. glad to come back. You know what I'm saying? I love this. No, for sure. For sure. You're good. <laughs> Let's man. do it. That'd be a blast. Yeah. So well, let's talk about what you're doing now. What would you know? You're out. Yeah, you're, I see you're working on the YouTube. So what's so what's the goal for that? You want to keep growing it? Oh, absolutely, Obviously. absolutely. I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping all of your fans come to my channel, Black Zach Fifty. Look me up on YouTube. Um, yeah, I've been. I'm gonna bring in a couple of guests. I have a, a young lady, a friend of mine that used to sneak. Not for me though, but she would sneak uh, contraband into the jail. I'm gonna have her come in and kind of show how she does that and how two people sitting together real comfortably how you actually pass the contraband to each other. You know what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's a very interesting concept. Uh, interviewing a couple of people who do look, little minor fraud um, details, just bringing in some different variety of people, just talking about, right now I'm putting together my life story, but just talking about different things, kind of the, the, the tender underbelly of the fraud world, you know, of, of conning and scamming, not, not, the big, not the big time people like Matt gets, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's exciting. I'm excited to see uh, see all these things that you put out. We'll be sure to watch. Oh, they're coming now. They're coming. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Thank I you. I love it. Well, cool. Yeah, so you got to go. We'll wrap up for sure. And let's definitely have you back on again. This was an awesome please, conversation. Please, please. You, you guys are great, story. man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. You're great. We, team. Loved great it. we love it. We love your energy. Yeah, you got energy. great yeah, energy, you're dude. You're a blast. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm I can see what Tony Robbins was saying. Robbins firing. Like, listen, we don't want to bring you back on because we think we're going to be holding you back from better podcasts. No, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you, you're good. You we think you could have a much better show on your own, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was awesome. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I loved hearing the story. It's really interesting, thank and uh, I love your energy. So your show is going to be really good. Oh, thank yeah. you, man. I appreciate it. you guys. Have an awesome show too, man. You really do. I appreciate it, and thank you thank for the opportunity. No of problem. Course, and I'll yeah. send you all the clips and everything. And right before we end, uh, Zach, I'll tell you what to do uh, just to get it uploaded. And then uh, we'll be all set to go. Okay. Sweet. I got you. Okay. Thanks, Zach. All right. All right. Awesome. All, right. all right, guys. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you next week. All right. Peace. Later. Peace, people. All right. <laughs>